This video is made possible by donations to the United States Lighthouse Society from people like you. Thank you all for being here today uh, for another one of our U.S. Lighthouse Society Zoom events. Uh, I welcome you on behalf of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Uh, I think uh, most of you know me, but in case you don't, I'm Jeremy Dontremont. I'm the historian for the U.S. Lighthouse Society, and I host the uh, podcast, the weekly podcast uh, for the Society called Lighthearted. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, so again, it's it's great to see you all here uh, on this Saturday afternoon. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have uh, a lot of people in the lighthouse community, people who work with uh, lighthouses around the country, involved with various nonprofit organizations and so forth. Uh, and we have some really interesting people in the audience. So I hope we'll hear from, uh, you're all interesting, of course. I shouldn't say that some, some are more interesting than others, but I hope we'll... Uh, some of the people in the lighthouse community will, I hope we'll hear from when we do our Q and A after Dan's presentation. Uh, so I need to remind everybody to uh, mute your mics. If you haven't, while well, you're all muted, I believe at this point, keep it that way, please. If uh, you look at the uh, little microphone icon in the lower left of your Zoom controls, that should have a red line through it. If it doesn't, click on it so it does. Uh, because otherwise everybody will hear everything you're saying and hear your TV in the background or whatever it might be. So we really appreciate it if you could keep uh, your microphones muted. And also, uh, nobody should be scared, sharing sharing your screen uh, besides uh, me or Dan. Uh, so please don't click on screen sharing. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. So uh, I've... I'm going to get right into it here because I know you're all anxious to hear Dan May's presentation. Uh, I have known, <clears throat> excuse me, known Dan May for quite a few years. In fact, we were talking on Zoom the other day, <clears throat> excuse me, and I was going through some old photos while we were talking and I, I found a photo of Dan uh, circa early 2000s, That's right, true. Dan, yeah. uh, of you yeah. and the boat uh, with Boston Light behind you. Uh, so that was, uh, yeah, it was easily more than 20 years ago. During, uh, we weren't quite sure what the, the particular event was at Boston Light that day, but it was neat finding that photo. We also go back to the uh, early 2000s at uh, things related to Plum Island Light, which Dan's going to be talking about as well. Uh, so um, let me give you a little background on Dan May before I turn it over to him for the presentation here. Um, well, before I before I uh, go over some of Dan's uh, bio, let me tell you also that uh, it's been my pleasure in recent months to uh, be involved in the publication of a book. The U.S. Lighthouse Society has published Dan's new book, and of course, he'll be talking about that as well. It's uh, Preserving America's Lighthouses, Memoirs of a Coast Guard Civil Engineer. Uh, and uh, I'm so pleased to be part of that. It was so much fun to work on. Dan, of course, has been involved in a, a lot of great uh, Lighthouse-related projects over the years. So we'll say more about that book as we go on today. So let me give you some background on Dan. Dan is a 1979 graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. He served in a wide variety of operational engineering and staff positions during his nearly 34-year 34 34 year active duty career. During his career as an ocean engineer, he was responsible for the design of numerous national level projects. He uh, served as a project engineer for a number of major lighthouse projects, which you'll be hearing a lot about today. Uh, and uh, Rear Admiral May also served as the chief of the operations division for the multi-agency search and recovery effort following the crash of John F. Kennedy Jr.'s plane in uh, July 1999. He served as a commander as the commander of Coast Guard Group Boston from 2001 to 2004, 
uh, overseeing all Coast Guard operations from Plymouth Bay to the border of New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, as assistant superintendent of the Coast Guard Academy from 2006 to 2008. After selection to the rank of Rear Admiral in 2007, he served as the Director of Reserve and Training uh, from 2008 to 2010, and as the Commander of the Personnel Service Center from 2010 to 2012 at Coast Guard Headquarters in Washington, D.C. Rear Admiral May is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Distinguished Service Medal, three Legion of Merit awards, and two Meritorious Service Medals. He was the 1992 Rear Admiral John B. Oren Award recipient for the most significant contributions to the Coast Guard Civil, Civil uh, slash Ocean Engineering Program. He was also the 2011 recipient of the Reserve Officers Association Minuteman of the Year Award. Following military service, Rear Admiral May was selected to be director of the Massachusetts Municipal Police Academy, serving from 2013 to uh, April of 2019. Now fully retired. I, I smile when I say that. Yes. I know that Dan is, how did you find time to work before? I'm sure you're wondering, Dan. Mm -hmm. But um, now fully retired, uh, Rear Admiral May and his wife Leslie live in West Newbury, Massachusetts, and Inglewood, Florida. He currently serves on the U.S. Lighthouse Society's Board of Directors and uh, very much uh, continues to work as a consultant on lighthouse projects. And I think we may hear about that as well today. So at this point, I'm gonna turn things over to Dan, but I actually need to uh, share my screen. I'll be doing the, uh, that part of it from my screen. So just bear with me while I get ready to do that. And here I go. Well, while Jeremy's doing that, I'll uh, thank Jeremy well, and the US Lighthouse Society. Uh, okay. I'm actually going to pause a moment. I'll let you uh, say what you'd like to say by way of introduction, Dan, before I go okay, ahead. Okay, well, thanks. Story. What uh, that uh, what that intro really means is that I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> We're about but, the same age, Dan, so don't say that. Okay, but uh, good to see everybody tonight. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. And uh, I do want to thank uh, Jeremy and the Society for um all the help and publishing the book um it's hard to cram uh, almost 34 years uh, of your work into a book uh, and even more difficult to cram a book into uh, about a 45 minute presentation but that's what i'm going to try to do this evening so um we'll try to do that we may have to speed up uh, as we go but hopefully we'll uh, we'll get through it all and save some time for Q and A. So, yes, uh, Jeremy, yeah. if you can throw that up there, we'll yeah. get rolling. I will, and thank you for mentioning Q and A, Dan, because I meant to say after Dan's presentation. Well, I guess I did say it a little bit, but we will open up for Q and A. Uh, so you can ask questions in the chat as we go along, but Dan won't be able to answer until he finishes the presentation. But we'll also uh, open it up for verbal questions as well. So, go ahead and share my screen. And here we go, and hopefully you're all seeing the presentation. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, so um, here's the book on the left, and uh, picture on the right uh, I'll talk about a little bit further, but um, I grew up in a small town, and, and we'll jump to the next one there, Jeremy. I grew up in a small town, at least I thought it was a small town, uh, it was when I was there growing up, Orlando, Florida, not so much today, but uh, here I am uh, probably about uh, 10, 10 or 11 years old there with one of the, uh, uh, the largemouth bass that I used to fish for. But I spent my whole waking uh, time as a young uh, kid growing up in Orlando, Florida, wherever I could find water. Uh, so I was swimming, uh, surfing, boating water skiing, whatever I could do around the water. And of course, uh, that led me to the Coast Guard Academy, um, one of our five service academies in the country in 1975, graduated high school and off I went to beautiful New London, Connecticut. And for those of you that may not be too familiar with our service academies, uh, West Point, Annapolis, Air Force Academy, Coast Guard Academy, and the Merchant Marine Academy. It's a four-year college education, and in return for that uh, education you, you get, you 
agree to serve uh, five years in the military service. So um, I look back now saying, well, gee, I served uh, almost 34 years. I think the Coast Guard made a pretty good investment investment there, but um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and during that time at the academy, you had to choose a major. Now, the Coast Guard Academy is very limited. It's an engineering college, only about eight or nine majors. Most all of them were engineering majors. And so uh, with that affinity for the water and growing up in Florida, uh, I thought ocean engineering would be the perfect major for me. So I want to give you a little bit of flavor of what's an ocean engineer, what are the things that a an ocean engineer and a Coast Guard would be involved in. So we'll jump to the next slide here, um, Jeremy, and we'll uh, take a look at some of the uh, uh, structures. So uh, basically an ocean engineer is a civil engineer with uh, some additional education and training in what uh, happens when you get in, on, or near a water environment. So. It's designing, building, maintaining structures on the water. So you get all that uh, uh, influence of the water, whether it be corrosion, uh, wave action, wind, current, all those sorts of things. So I'm going to throw a few structures and we'll kind of go through the next couple slides uh, uh, and let you just see a variety. And what I'm trying to do here is show you the diversity of structures on or near the water. And you can just see, now this one will stop for a second. Um, down to the left, I think most of you will probably recognize that. That's Minots. So uh, no land here. It's just a structure, what we call a wave swept. And I caught this picture uh, just as a wave was approaching. Um, I'd been out to Minots many times. It is very, very difficult to get on Minots. Uh, but uh, I've been on there many times. It's, uh, it's an amazing structure to get on. And then uh, up in the top is, uh, that's actually Curtis Island Lighthouse uh, up in off Camden, Maine. And uh, I wanted to show you, okay, it's not just the exterior of the structure, it's also the interior. So as an ocean engineer, you're involved with the interior as well. In this case, a beautiful fourth order lens. And I think that's a wind jammer that I was trying to capture through the window of the, the uh, lantern house. And then of course, to the right, I don't know if everybody will recognize that or not. That is the Neville off Cape Nettick. And I took this one because uh, if you've ever been there, you know it's a little island uh, really unto itself, surrounded by water. So uh, there's your challenge in trying to maintain structures when you're in that kind of environment. Now this. I think I took this picture and there'll be a theme here as we go. Uh, I'm an early morning person and it was not uncommon for me to be rolling out of my house uh, in New England uh, at two, three o'clock. And my neighbors thought I was crazy, but I would roll out two, three o'clock in the morning to get to Maine by seven or eight in the morning. And so this was on one of my many trips north. I stopped here, but this is probably 4.30 probably 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, I got this picture of the novel. So we'll jump to uh, the next one, Jeremy, and we'll see a couple other, uh, here's uh, a couple other structures for you. They are on or in the water, and the one to the left there, now that's the Hudson River. So how would you like to work on that structure uh, on the banks of the Hudson River? And then, of course, uh, on the right is one of the uh, offshore towers that the Coast Guard built. That was Brenton Reef uh, in Narragansett Bay, no longer there. Uh, that was a project of mine as well. We had decided we no longer needed it and uh, we we took it down. And uh, so that was one of my projects as well. And then lastly, we get one more shot here. This one's got a interesting story. Here you go. So what do you think about this? I get a I get a phone call from the folks up in Saugerties, New York. We have a small aids to navigation team up there. And they say, um, you know, we've got a problem. One of our structures uh, on the Hudson River. Okay, yeah, what's the problem? Well, it got hit by a barge. Uh, okay, so did it do any damage? Well, it's hard to explain. Okay, well, can you send me a picture? So uh, this is the picture that they sent me. <laughs> so... 
uh, as you can see, there is no structure left. The total structure was totally destroyed and is gone. We had to rebuild it from scratch, but I had to give the, uh, the Coast Guard, and this is typical Coast Guard, Semper Paratus, uh, can-do guys. They were determined that they were going to keep that channel lit. So this was their uh, kind of a Rue Goldberg uh, solution to keeping it lit until we could uh, get a contractor and get up there and rebuild it. They just stuck the lantern with a solar panel. So I wanted to give you that kind of a flavor as we go through uh, the discussion uh, today to see you the many things that we, we do as an ocean engineer. I'm gonna mention two other gentlemen uh, during my, my talk. Uh, they were civilians that worked for the Coast Guard. Both of them worked for the Coast Guard for more than 30, 35 years, I think. Uh, Charlie Baines uh, from the 5th Coast Guard District. He's no longer with us. Charlie, unfortunately, passed away last year. And then the other gentleman, uh, Harry Duvall. And uh, Jeremy and I are hoping to do a, a podcast with Harry. Harry worked out of the Boston office. And um, for more than 35 years, Harry and Charlie both, they were the two hardest working civilians I ever worked with in my career. They went with me everywhere that I went. They were with me, uh, whether it be in uh, the Atlantic coast or up here in New England. And uh, when I say everywhere, I mean everywhere, helicopter, boat, ship, uh, offshore, and morning, noon, night, if it was 4 a.m., it was, they were there. Neither of them, I I don't think I ever saw either of them request a penny of overtime. They were just dedicated, hardworking guys that uh, is, is a trademark, I think, to, to the Lighthouse community. So you'll hear me mention their names. Uh, upon graduation from the Coast Guard Academy, I headed to a ship off of Virginia. And then uh, when uh, my tour was up, I came ashore as the ocean engineer for the 5th Coast Guard District, which is in Portsmouth, Virginia. And that area is from the South Carolina, North Carolina border all the way up to Southern New Jersey. I was it. Uh, I was the one and only ocean engineer. This is 1980, 81 timeframe. And um, I was it working with Charlie. Uh, I did most of all the engineering work. Charlie was the electronics guy who handled automations and that sort of thing. So uh, I want to take you through the outer banks first to show you uh, many of the lights that Charlie and I worked on. So if we'll jump over there, Jeremy. These are some that you'll be very familiar with. And um, I call these the majestic lighthouses of our country because they just were in my eyes some of the the best looking and these are all my photographs from that time period down there uh, working in the early 80s and um, Kirtuk Beach to your right I thought um, was simply amazing and it was the last one of the the four or five we'll talk about Hatteras and Cape Lookout in a minute but it was the last one built and oddly, I thought at the time, it was not painted. And I didn't know if, um, and now these were all built in the, uh, you know, in the 18, it was after the lighthouse service had come in uh, post uh, with our board uh, now established in the mid 1850s, we had now had a lighthouse board of engineers. So um, they were still scrapped for, for money, I suspect. So I often wondered, did they just run out of paint or, or why was it that they decided not to, to paint Curatech? But I'm glad they did really because it's a beautiful, beautiful lighthouse and uh, it really is striking as compared to the others. Uh, Body Island off to the left there. Um, it uh, was the shortest, if you can call uh, 156 feet short. Uh, but uh, the easiest, I think, to paint because it uh, had those uh, black and white bands, but uh, named after the body family, that uh, body island there, but uh, another striking uh, majestic tower. And then we'll move over to our other couple that uh, uh, Charlie and I spent time with. Um, we were usually down the Outer Banks um, half a dozen or more times a year. All of these were automated during our time frame there uh, in the late 70s, early 80s when I arrived. Um, 
Cape Lookout on the right, uh, 1859. It was the first of the real tall, majestic uh, lighthouses on the Outer Banks. And one small little fact, a lot, a lot of the local boaters knew if you lined up those white squares, you had due north, south. And if you lined up the black where the points came, that was east and west. So that day mark actually did help uh, boaters and mariners in the area. Uh, to the left, Ocracroke Light. Uh, built in 1823, so 200 years old this year, uh, designed and built by a guy by the name of Noah Porter. He, he built the tower and the keeper's quarters for $11,000, so uh, that's pretty darn good, I think. 75-foot uh, tower. The interesting thing about Ocracroak, and I talked a little bit about this in the book, it, it always struck me as funny because um, I felt like it should have had a larger lantern room. It just seemed like a small lantern room for that size of a tower. Of course, I, I wasn't going to argue with Noah Porter. He seemed like a, a great guy, so I'll uh, tip my hat to him. Uh, one project, project that Charlie and I did get involved at Oka Croak, it was the weirdest thing. This is in 1981. Uh, 82 time frame. It had one of the original, it had a fourth order for now lens, but it had this original, probably turn of the century lamp changer. It was only a two place lamp changer, but it took a screw based lamp. In other words, it wasn't uh, your normal halogen or some other, it was a screw based lamp. And down on the Outer Banks, uh, the Coast Guard guys came from uh, Fort Macon, which was a good distance away. So we hired a civilian that would periodically, it's uh, one of the civilian wikis that we had around the country at this time. And the guy did a great job, but a lot of times that two-place lamp changer, one light would burn out. And so if he couldn't find a, a lamp or a bulb. He just went and grabbed whichever one he could find. So on any given day, if Charlie and I were there, we would find like a 40 watt lamp or a 60 watt lamp. It was, it was crazy. And um, we did get reports back uh, on what's going on with the light. So Ch Charlie and I had discovered uh, right about that time, a company by the name of API had come out with a brand new AC powered lamp changer, four place lamp changer that took the halogen lamps, 100, 150, 250 watt lamps. And so we, I think we bought probably the first one the Coast Guard ever bought from them. And Charlie and I went down and uh, we built a stand for it. We install it. And uh, last I've heard that that lamp changer is still installed today. <laughs> in that fourth order lens. So pretty pretty neat light. All right, Jeremy, we'll jump over to probably the uh, next slide there is probably the most famous of all is Cape Hatteras. Could I ask a question, Dan? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sure. But I'm just wondering, are you seeing um, the list of participants on the screen right now? Like towards the I right? Am. You are. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so it's sort of in the way. I've, <laughs> I'm not used to doing yeah. it quite this way, so. I put it up, I hope, more out yeah. of the way there. I'm trying to watch for people coming yeah. in. If you, so sorry yeah, if about you that. Went to full screen, yeah, if you went to full screen, would it? Well, it is well, full screen. That the would... present, presentation okay. is on full screen. So uh, so I apologize for that being on the screen. I'll try to keep it out of the way as much as I can. So anyway. Well, it we'll looks, just... looks fine to me, and hopefully everybody else can see it, uh, at least on my screen. It. Uh, uh, you, you can still see everything very well. So Hatteras, uh, I spent a lot of time in Hatteras. It's an interesting situation at Hatteras. Um, Hatteras Light uh, is the National Seashore, Cape Hatteras National Seashore. I took this picture in the winter of 81. Um, there have been some large storms. We had some erosion there. And um, I did some work uh, on behalf of the uh, National uh, Park Service who asked me to to look into it. And and as an ocean engineer, they wanted my opinion. And so I spent a good bit of time researching all the records. What I found was that uh, from the initial time there, that, that there was 
three, 400 feet more of, of land that had been eroded over time. But what I found was there was this cyclic of erosion and then building back out. So uh, the land would regain a lot of material over time, but it never quite got back to where it was. So it ended up being a net loss of material and uh, my findings and my report to the National Park Service was that uh, uh, they should consider moving the structure. This was 1981-82 time frame. Um, and so uh, obviously nobody had done that to date and it was quite daunting for the Park Service. So they kind of just let that go. The land built back out, but as we all know, uh, it eroded again, and uh, 1999, it was moved uh, uh, at a cost of about $12 million. So uh, eventually, it, it had to get moved. All right, we'll keep going here. Um, Jeremy, if we can keep going. Thomas Point, uh, the Chesapeake Bay was the other area that Charlie and I worked in quite, quite a bit. Um, and... Uh, this is probably one of my most famous lights uh, of all. Thomas Point Show Light, uh, one of the chapters of the society here. Uh, very great program. They've done an awesome job of restoration tours if you get a chance. So Charlie and I worked on uh, Thomas Point quite a bit. We always were trying to automate Thomas Point, but we couldn't uh, because of the weather requirements. There were three Coast Guardsmen that served here two weeks on, one week off. And if you look up on the top of the, above the uh, lantern uh, cupola there, you'll see some weather instruments. Uh, I took this picture on a, on a winter day. You can see snow and ice uh, and getting on and off. Uh, Thomas Point was always treacherous, but um, on a winter day it was even more so because of the ice that would form down below. But uh, we were able to automate in 86. I came back. I was uh, assigned elsewhere, but I came back and helped Charlie automate it. There's a couple of stories I tell in the book about Thomas, Thomas Point uh, that hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy. But uh, a great, great place to be. And then I want to show you a few other uh, lights in Chesapeake Bay. We'll, we'll move on here. And I just want to give you a flavor again. Uh, if we can move on there, Jeremy, we'll uh, move on to a couple others here. This is just giving you a, a little bit of flavor of um, some other uh, lights in Chesapeake Bay. These are caisson structures, cast iron, all built in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, sunk down into the bed of the bay and, and then uh, hollowed out, excavated, and then a structure built on them. So... Uh, kind of neat. Uh, Charlie and I spent a lot of time at these uh, lights during our time. And then lastly, we'll jump over to uh, the last uh, bit of lights that I worked on down at the Atlantic Coast area. If we can jump to the next one, uh, Jeremy, there we go. Offshore towers. And um, there were six of these that were built by the Coast Guard. They were built to replace our light ships, which had operated off the coast. And so, uh, as you can see in the center picture there, that's frying pan shows. You can see the old light ship uh, frying pan in the foreground there. But these were offshore towers. I call them Texas towers because uh, they're similar to the oil rigs. But um, basically a crew of five, and they had diesel engine generators, fuel tanks, a 5,000 square foot house to live in. None of these are owned by the Coast Guard any longer. Um, I think one is privately owned actually now. And then um, I wanted to show you down to the right there, um, one of the many means that uh, we had to get, that's a Coast Guard helicopter. That was the best and the easiest way to get out there, but many, many times we couldn't do that. And we went by boat. And it is a long boat ride, especially to Frying Pan Shoals, 32 miles. Um, an old 44-footer is what Charlie and I used to ride on. And uh, they could do about six or eight knots best. Um, so if you can imagine, 30, you got to go 32 miles. Um, that's a good four to six-hour trip. And many times, I think we were black and blue from hanging on for that period of time. But uh, 
was was interesting uh, working on those those towers. I left Virginia. I went off to graduate school. I was one of the fortunate ones for the Coast Guard to get chosen to go to graduate school. Coast Guard sent me to the University of Rhode Island. I got my master's degree in ocean engineering. I came back to work on the Gulf Coast in a combined Coast Guard weather service office. That's how I got involved in in um, automating Thomas Point because I was connected to the weather service. We operated buoys as well as uh, weather systems on lighthouses, uh, actually all over the world, but mostly around the US, Great Lakes. We'll talk about a couple of those projects in a minute. And then I went off to uh, a really fun job as a uh, young uh, lieutenant. I was a commanding officer of a Coast Guard station. So I got to uh, run a crew of about 50 folks and we did search and rescue law enforcement, all the many missions that the Coast Guard involved on a daily basis. And then um, uh, the Coast Guard said, well, uh, you know, we invested all this money in you for your ocean engineering uh, education. We want to put that to good use. So they sent me to New England, uh, Warwick, Rhode Island, which a brand new office opened up in 1991. So if we can jump over uh, to that, uh, Jeremy, we'll start uh, with my first big project shortly after I arrived in 1991 uh, at the new civil engineering office. I was the senior ocean engineer by that point. I headed up a team of other engineers. And the first project that I was handed was Montauk Light, which I've come to love. It's one of my favorite lighthouses on the planet. This picture I just took a few weeks ago uh, while I've been involved in doing some other work with them. And this was at the completion of their uh, $2 million renovation of the keeper's quarters in the tower. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, steal a little bit of Jeremy's thunder. We're going to do a talk on on this project in, in a couple of weeks. Jeremy will be sending that out. So. Uh, give you a little preview of coming attractions here that we'll be talking about this in greater detail. But um, the uh, fourth oldest lighthouse in America, John C uh, McComb Jr. architect with the design. He was a famous architect at the time. Um, and we'll talk about a couple uh, other national historic landmarks, uh, Block Island Southeast, Boston Line, of course, Montauk, uh, and Thomas Point also uh, landmark. So we we only have 12 of those, which I have found to be amazing uh, with all the lighthouses, only 12 are national historic landmarks. But um, an interesting thing, as most of you know, when we built lighthouses back in the day, we looked around to see what material was around. Fortunately, in Maine, we had a lot of granite, uh, not so much in Montauk. Uh, sandstone. So the tower was built out of sandstone, probably not the best material, but it's what they had readily available. So let's go to the next slide, uh, Jeremy, and we'll see this was uh, what I was looking at in 1991. And this is on the southwest side of the site. Um, thoroughly uh, attacked from all angles by uh, erosion. And Senator Moynihan from New York had authorized a Coast Guard $600,000 to see what we could do to prevent uh, further erosion and try to make sure that we protected this icon at, at Montauk. So I was handed the project. I ended up spending a lot of time at Montauk. I did some research. The other challenge that I had on this project was it had to be done. The money was only available that year. It had to be done in that year. So um, I had to quickly get on my horse and uh, do some good thinking and figure out what to do here. Now, uh, Montauk had a long history of erosion and uh, means to protect it. Uh, there was a breakwater that was built in the 40s. And then um, a woman by the name of Georgiana Reed had come up with a terracing uh, schematic that allowed the water to not be as destructive, which really worked quite well with her terracing. And we also use gabions, which are little cubes, if you will, filled with stone in a wire mesh cage that would also help dissipate the energy. So what 
what I came up with uh, was the design of a revetment. And folks will say, okay, I've heard of jetties, I've heard of groins. What is a revetment? Well, the whole purpose is a revetment. Most of them are built out of stone, but they can be built out of other uh, substrates. But the whole idea behind a revetment is to dissipate the energy and to reflect and dissipate and make that energy go away in some shape uh, or form so that it doesn't do destructive uh, damage to the site. So if we can jump to the next one, Jeremy, we'll walk you through this. This was, this was actually a picture I took on October. This gives you an idea of Mother Nature's fury. I was actually there on October 1991, and, uh, October 31st, uh, Halloween night. I was up in the tower actually, and I shared this story with Jeremy. I uh, wanted to get some pictures of the wave action. I actually crawled out onto the catwalk. Uh, and I can tell everyone if you um, ever get that idea, don't do it. Uh, I learned very quickly that that's not a smart thing to do. I was pinned against the side of that lighthouse in about two seconds. And I literally had to crawl my way back in, but I did get some great pictures. This was one I took down below that shows you the force of Mother Nature. So if we get going to the next slide, you'll see the revetment. This is what my design in, 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 uh, entailed. It was 5,000 tons uh, of stone we put in there. It was 475 feet of linear uh, property that the Coast Guard we had to protect. Uh, if you do the math on that, that's about uh, 10 million pounds of stone. This is looking northeast here on these pictures. Um, of, and we built the revetment with a shelf so that you could still surf cast. But you get the idea. The water runs up and is dissipated. That energy is dissipated. And then we'll go to the next next slide here. We'll see on the other side here. This is looking down to the southwest that uh, little pillbox in the back there, that was a gun placement that was up on the top of the hill at one time. As you can see, it uh, tumbled down the side of the bluff there, which we certainly didn't want the lighthouse to do. So, But this gives you a whole idea of what the revetment looked like. And um, having looked at it uh, last week, it's still there. Uh, it has served very well for uh, more than 30 years, which is uh, makes me very, very happy in, in knowing that uh, I was part of that. And we'll go to the next picture here. We'll show you what it looks like today because the folks at Montauk and the state of New York have combined with the Corps of Engineers, and they have put in a total... Uh, stone protection around the entire point. I think uh, the price tag on that was somewhere in the neighborhood of about $50 million. Now they went around uh, and tied in with our Coast Guard uh, built revetment, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but it's it's amazing to see that uh, that's there now. Uh, quite amazing. And it should be for for generations literally to come well protected. So upon completion of that project, my next uh, one that seemed to land on my doorstep, oh, one last shot here of Montauk. I, um, for those of you that have been there, and we did have a tour with the society last year. Uh, this is the three and a half, one, I think one of the most beautiful lenses um, uh, ever built, uh, three and a half water clamshell uh, bivalve lens, uh, bb and made. Absolutely gorgeous. This lens served from 1903 to 1987 in the tower. And I'll give you one more hint uh, of a coming attraction. It's no longer in the museum. And if you remember the picture at the beginning of me standing, that was the lens. It is now back in the lantern room. And we'll, we'll tell you more about that story in coming weeks. All right, Jeremy, we'll move over to my next big uh, project, Block Island Southeast. Uh, as soon as Montauk was uh, pretty much done, I was off to Block Island Southeast. This shows a picture I took um, early 92, 93 timeframe. Uh, you can see what the obvious issue is here. 200-foot uh, tall bluff. 
Um, and I always thought that Block Island Southeast, uh, just an absolutely gorgeous, uh, it's a Gothic uh, revival design. And the interesting thing about the lighthouse, and it certainly made our work a little tougher in the moving of the lighthouse, it's an integral design. In other words, the tower is integral with the structure. And you'll see uh, in other lighthouse where that tower is separate from the keeper's house. In this case, it was an integral part. And when we did the move of it, um, we made sure that we kept those in an integral part. We wanted to make sure that which made things a little bit more complicated. So again, um, Congressman John Chafee involved in this project. Seemed like all my projects had, had congressmen involved in one shape or, or another. So um, Senator Chafee had worked out with the Coast Guard, the state of Rhode Island and the Corps of Engineers to come up with the funds. Uh, I think the Coast Guard actually ended up selling the land to the uh, state of Rhode Island. And in return, it was given to the um, Block Island Southeast Foundation, which uh, worked together with the Corps of Engineers. Uh, and off we were running uh, with a great project to move it uh, about uh, uh, 2,000 tons here to move uh, the weight of the structure. And uh, the company hired was International Chimney, who you'll hear more about, a great company out of Buffalo, New York. Uh, Rick Lohr, Joe Jakubik, great guys to work with. Uh, they did a phenomenal job on this project. They partnered with a company out of um, Maryland called Expert House Movers. And it will jump to the next couple of slides here. In theory, it's, it's pretty easy to move the light. You just jack it up. Uh, not so much in practice, but in theory, it's easy. You just jack it up, put it on some rails, and then slide it along those rails. Now, we moved it about 275 feet uh, back. But one of the interesting things we found is, well, two, two problems we ran into immediately. The location where they wanted to move the lighthouse to was exactly the location where we had a skeleton tower with a temporary light on it. So the first thing I had to do was build another temporary light and take down the one that was now there and been there since 1990. And then the second problem we ran into was there was no foundation under um, the lighthouse. It was simply large stones that had been placed there. So International Chimney uh, came in, they put a, poured in a gunite uh, a foundation which solidified the structure and supported the structure so we could get some rails in. Uh, and here we are cutting, cutting through that gunite to get the rails in. And then I got a couple other pictures here I'll show you real quickly. We'll get through. Here it is up on rails. And like I said, it um, it's uh, simple in theory, but uh, just an amazing project uh, executed flawlessly by International Chimney and expert house movers. Uh, people used to ask me, what do you what do you use for lubrication on the rails? It was a simple solution, ivory soap. Ivory soap, biodegradable, very environmentally friendly is what we lubricated the rails with. And then I think I've got one more, one more shot here of once it's so though these were the manifolds of jacks, 30, 38 jacks, if I remember correctly, 60 ton jacks that kept everything on a level pace. And then one more, Jeremy, we'll get to the finished product. Um, and here she sits in the new location. And then off to the right, just out of the almost just the edge of that picture, you'll see. It's a piece of a rock, and, and that is known as Merle's Rock. Merle was the superintendent on this project, and uh, after we got it relocated, uh, of course, it's the busy summer, summer of 93. Uh, a lot of folks came out, and they always asked, well, where was the lighthouse? We see it's moved now, but where was it? So Merle got tired of answering that question. So one day he took a crane, he picked up about a, couple of thousand pound rock and he put the rock over on that spot exactly where the tower had sat previously and when people would ask that question he would say well you see that rock over there that's where it was so we affectionately named it Merle's Rock it's still there today uh, in honor of Merle 
And then the next part of this project uh, got me directly involved was in relighting. And so once it was moved, the foundation wanted to relight it. And um, we couldn't use the existing lens, so we wanted to come up with something else. So we spent some time discussing, couldn't really come up with a good solution until I remembered that Cape Lookout, uh, when Charlie Baines had automated that, he had taken a first order Fresnel lens, which we discovered was the original lens in Block Island and uh, before the flash panel first order lens. So uh, I sent a crew to, to Virginia. Uh, they uh, took the lens, which was now stored in a warehouse. We, I rented a truck and uh, we put that lens on the truck and we drove very slowly, very carefully back to Rhode Island. And then we took the lens, refurbished it all. And then here we are uh, putting it back in the tower. And I think Joe Jackabick may be with us this afternoon. Joe, I think you're in this picture uh, directing operations down below, but uh, International Chimney, uh, I uh, gave them a small contract, about $75,000 to refurbish the lantern room before we put the lens in. We got the lens back in. And then I think I've got one last photo here that shows the lens in place. And then I designed this pedestal uh, with the two-place thousand watt lamp changer and the green, as everybody I think probably knows, Block Island Southeast is green. And it's, uh, you can see it behind Jeremy in his screen that is sitting up there on the bluff and um, still operating today. That first order lens, uh, some uh, uh, almost 30 years later now operating uh, and uh, still continuing today. Uh, great project, which led me to the next big project, Highland Light. And uh, just like the two previous projects, I had another congressman involved in this one, uh, Jerry Studs, who was the congressman for the Cape and the Islands. And uh, this is way out on Churro. I'm going to give you a little bit of ge uh, geographic uh, uh, nomenclature here. Jeremy, if you can go to the next one, we'll, we'll see. Here you go. Now, uh, up on that very tip almost to Provincetown is where Highland Light is. And uh, in uh, in that map over there uh, where I was driving from, uh, uh, Rhode Island isn't even in that, in that uh, map. So I would uh, leave again very early in the morning out across, especially on a summer traffic day, uh, three, three and a half, sometimes four hours to get to Highland Light. Uh, spend all day and then another three and a half, four hours to get, get back home. Uh, so anyway, on this project, uh, what made this such a challenge? And I'll, I'll let you read all the, the details in, in the book, but um, there were two challenges. One, it was multiple people involved. There was the National Seashore. There was a historic golf course. There was a uh, old hotel that was run by the historical society called the Highland House. There was the town of Churro. We had a, a group of great uh, volunteers called the, uh, uh, they were with the Hero uh, Turo Historical Society. Uh, one of the gentlemen, uh, Gordon Russell, shown in the picture. They had started this Save the Light uh, campaign. And uh, so we had all these players involved. Congressman Studs came along and said, okay, Coast Guard, I'm going to authorize you uh, $600,000 to study, to study what you can do to save this lighthouse. No money to move it, no money to do anything other than just study it. So um, in the interest of time here, I'll, I'm going to tell you that um, what I ended up doing, I was able to do all the work I needed to do with my study for about 300,000. So I saved $300,000 in doing that. I partnered with Gordon Russell, you see right here. Sadly, Gordon passed away a few years ago, but Gordon, uh, I love Gordon. He was my uh, greatest uh, champion, but he was also my harsher critic. Uh, but I, I did everything to try to make uh, this 
was a, a happy day for Gordon, and he greatly appreciated it. They kicked in two hundred thousand dollars to give me five hundred. I figured it would be about a million and a half to move the light, based on our project at Block Island. So um, that gave me one third of the way. Uh, I worked a bunch of other deals, uh, and you can read about them in uh, between the state and the park to come up with the 1.5 million. And so if we can jump to the next slide there, Jeremy, here we are. This uh, shows you when we started, it was only 35 feet. That was the other thing I knew. Uh, if we wasted a lot of time studying or figuring out what to do, this lighthouse wasn't going to make it. Uh, I was determined to save this lighthouse uh, one way or another. So um, I came up with a way to do that. And if we see in the next slide there, Jeremy, we'll, you'll see now this, I learned my lesson uh, from Block Island. Well, I said, you know, there's no way that, um, and I ended up partnering with the Corps of Engineers on this again, and International Chimney won the contract. There was no way that I was gonna put out a contract unless I knew whether I had a, a foundation or not. So. One of the last things I did as, as the uh, project engineer, I went out to, uh, to uh, Churl one last time. I uh, got a backhoe from the National Park Service and we actually dug down and there's the hole that I dug. And believe it or not, I crawled underneath that uh, brick that you see there. And this lighthouse uh, was built with no foundation whatsoever, 1857. 65 foot tall, um, probably 400 ton tower with no foundation on shifting sands of the Cape. I couldn't believe that it was still standing uh, here in 1994, 95 when I was working on this. So uh, I got out of the hole, I stepped back, I looked behind me. I was only about 10 feet from the bluff. I looked up at that um, 400 ton tower uh, staring above me, I looked down at the hole and I decided it would be wise to close up that hole. So uh, we filled it in, off we went. And then the photo on the right there, you can see the foundation. We did put a new foundation in. You can see the new foundation expertly built again by International Chimney. And there she sits on the new foundation. All right, Jeremy, we'll uh, continue on. Uh, this uh, I stuck in here was one of my uh, pictures of uh, Highland Light. Again, uh, as I said, there's a theme here. This is about 4.35 a.m. early in the morning as the sun's rising in the east. I just thought it was a majestic uh, picture of Highland Light with the, uh, it's a DCB 224 in the lantern room. But so you can figure out what time I left uh, Rhode Island to get out to uh, Churl by 4.35 o'clock in the morning. All right, next next one there, Jeremy. Here we go, Boston Light, uh, which, uh, as we all know, uh, cited the very lighthouse in America, very first lighthouse in America. 1716, it's now the third old, oldest tower. Um, I have a long association with Boston Light, probably 13 or 14 years of my time I spent uh, in my engineering and also as the operational commander for, for Boston Light. And uh, so I'm gonna zip through. There are three things that I, that I really feel like I had a hand in accomplishing at Boston Light. We'll skip through a couple here, Jeremy, if you can go to the next. Um, I just wanna, here it is the view from, and uh, you can see it's the outermost island. It used to be the main channel, it's not anymore. Uh, and next slide, Jeremy, uh, here's some work that the Coast Guard did in the early 90s. Those steel cables were added um, in uh, early uh, 1800 uh, when there were some uh, cracks uh, and some bulges in the tower. It's built out of stone. Um, and then we'll go to the next one, uh, Jeremy. Uh, this gets me to one of the three things that... Uh, I was involved in one was restoring the keeper's house. Um, we did that ourselves and I'll, I'll let you read about that in the book. The 1884 is when I arrived in Boston in 1995, that keeper's house was a picture right out of the 1970s. Green shag carpet, 
14 layers of paint on everything, drop ceiling. It was just uh, hideous. We totally restored that ourselves uh, with the Coast Guard and Coast Guard funding. And then the other thing with my association with, with Boston Light was we had three Coast Guardsmen that were assigned here. They stood uh, duty two weeks on, one week off. And I was determined to come up with a solution that would enable us, us the Coast Guard, to be, have long-term long historic preservation, but also to find a better way to manage it. The three Coast Guardsmen weren't the right skill set. Um, the light was totally automated by the early 90s. And so I started this relationship with Senator Kennedy. And uh, as we all know the story, uh, I was successful in convincing him that I had a better idea uh, in creating a civilian keeper. And Sally, I think, is with us uh, this evening. Uh, Sally still serving in that position 20 some years later. But I um, went uh, and met with Senator Kennedy a number of times. Uh, the last visit I had with him to convince him to let us go forward, he said, OK, uh, I was a captain at the time. He said, all right, Captain May, uh, you have my uh, permission to proceed ahead and create your position and remove the Coast Guard. But you you must do one thing for me. And I said, yes, sir. What what can I do for you? He said, you you have to host me and my family on the island. And so I said, oh, we'll gladly do that. What I didn't know is that he was going to bring about 50 of his nieces, nephews, cousins, you name it, they came. And uh, thank goodness Sally was there with Jay Thompson, her husband, and a bunch of auxiliaries, and we kept everybody safe. And so uh, that was the, the second uh, major uh, item that I feel very proudly about being able to accomplish. It's still in place today. We'll see how it goes forth in the future. And then the third one, Jeremy, if we can jump to, uh, here's a couple of shots of the second order lens, and then we'll go to the, the next uh, slide. Here's looking down. One of the things I discovered is I could put in a pier and I could have the park service pay for it. Now that is a great thing if you're in the Coast Guard and you want to have somebody build a pier on your property. So uh, with my ocean engineering skills, in my spare time, I designed a pier and system, and I submitted it to the National Park Service. Now, it took five years for that project to come up. And we'll jump to the next one. Uh, here it is, five years down the road. It did get built, and um, it's taken some, some damage out there. But that was great. Um, another uh, million and a half dollar project uh, from the Park Service. And then one more, I think there's one more slide. Uh, my wife and I got to go back in 2010. They invited us back to celebrate the pier and a little bit of Boston light. So it was really a fun time being there. Um, I want to jump over. We're running short on time, but I want to jump over and just hit a few more lights before we wrap up here. Uh, so, Jeremy, let's go to a few more of my favorite places. Um, and I'm saying that facetiously. Plum Island. There's a lot of Plum Islands in, in around our country. This one is off the North Fork of Long Island. And if you're a fan of uh, Silence of the Lambs, you may recall in that movie, they offer Hannibal Lecter a one-week vacation on Plum Island uh, if he would agree to help them out. He declines, and um, you can understand why. Uh, it's a restricted island. has some old history. I, I go into some of the history of the island in the book. You can read on Fort Terry. But my project here at Plum Island was, uh, if you look on the picture to the left, uh, in 1978, that picture was from the 60s, but in 1978, there were five Coast Guardsmen stationed here. All five of them were mysteriously, suddenly removed from the island. And the Coast Guard transferred all property to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and that's the way it stood for a year or two until the boaters started complaining that they missed the light. There was a critical waterway there, Plum Gut. 
So uh, the light was reestablished by placing a small 155 millimeter lantern over there on that oil house. You see in the foreground, they put a solar panel and a small lantern and that became Plum Island Light in 1979, 1980 timeframe. It operated that way for about 11 or 12 years until we discovered that that old oil house was about to fall in the drink. So my project was, okay, come up with a solution. And so it took me many trips to Plum Island. You can read about those in the, uh, in the book. I literally had to sign my life away to get on the island. I discovered many things about the, the island. And um, it, uh, it is an interesting place. Uh, there is a group that now is involved. But let's jump ahead, uh, Jeremy. You can see uh, the Coast Guard guy. We ended up building a whole new tower here. We built a new, new foundation, this skeleton tower. And this is what's in place today, the lantern there. So we'll um, jump ahead uh, to one of my other famous Lynn Point. Uh, this is down in Connecticut uh, on the Connecticut River, Old Saybrook, built in 1838, 65-foot tool light. Now, I was working on a project there, Harry and I, and um, there's a beautiful area, as a lot of you know. One of the interesting things about lighthouses is there's always some beautiful houses nearby, or most of the time there are. Um, Nearby was uh, an area called Fenwick, and we would see an elderly lady walking her dog on early mornings or late afternoons, and we knew that to be Catherine Hepburn. And so uh, when we were finishing up the project, um, one of the caretakers came over and flagged me down and said, hey, I just want to let you know uh, that Catherine Hepburn is very excited about, you know, seeing all the work you're doing on the lighthouse. It's her favorite lighthouse, and she just wanted you to know that. So I said, okay, great. And then I got thinking later on, um, I was back, uh, I took a picture of the lighthouse once we'd finished and I had it blown up and I had it framed and I wrapped it all up. And on one of my last visits, I stopped and I saw the caretaker and I said, hey, would you mind giving this to Catherine Hepburn and just let her know. And I, and I just put a little note that uh, I was glad she liked our work and I wanted to share this picture of of her favorite light that she could hang on her wall. So I, I thought that would be the end of it. Okay, I moved on to whatever next lighthouse I was working on. And Jeremy, if we can go to the next slide, you'll see it was not the end of it. Um, and uh, Catherine Hepburn was so kind to write me a little handwritten note with her picture. And um, it's uh, a little phrase you see on the left. I have lived by this phrase my whole career. You always meet the nicest people at Lighthouse. That's still true today. Um, and I'm sure most of all you would, would agree. So let's move on, Jeremy. We'll jump over uh, Watch Hill, another one of my favorite places, an absolute gorgeous piece of real estate. Um, and it's another one of those uh, interesting things you learn. And I, I'm always still learning as I go around working on Lighthouses. Um, this was a project of mine to, to, I built actually a little revetment here that was some storm damage. And um, I got to meet the son of uh, the caretaker or the uh, keeper that was here. His name was Larry Congdon. And Larry Congdon was the keeper back from 1924 to 1943. He ended up serving uh, 27 years working for the Lighthouse Service, but he was here during the hurricane of 38. And his son shared with me this story of how they took refuge in the light tower and the assistant light keeper as well. And that's the only way they survived. Um, hundreds of people were, were killed by that hurricane. They weren't named back then. Uh, and it's an amazing story of survival, but uh, these lighthouses have quite a history of helping keep people alive. And that's one of the ones that I ran across I wanted to share with you. And we'll keep moving here, Jeremy. Uh, I know I'm running late on, on time, but I'll see if I can wrap up here with the last couple little projects. And um, one of the things that 
an ocean engineer gets involved in is buoys. And uh, during my career, I did a lot of work with buoys. This was one of those. Uh, buoy is just a structure in the water, but it floats. It's not attached to the ground. So this was one that I worked on. This was Hurricane Bob had picked up this buoy and plopped it here on the wharf. Uh, my project was getting it off, which uh, I'll let you read about, but uh, it was an amazing project. We safely did that. And then one more, uh, Jeremy, if we could go to uh, our next one. This was, uh, I've got a couple of lighthouse or uh, buoy projects that I talk about in the book, but this was off the coast of uh, Eastern shore of Virginia where I partnered with the Marine uh, Air Group folks who flew this uh, CH-46 helicopter. I probably saved, uh, I think we added up about $75,000 worth of buoys. At that time, I was, uh, this was the early 80s, I was a Lieutenant JG. I was making probably about $15,000 a year. And my wife suggested that maybe I should... Um, to work for the Coast Guard for what I could save them rather than be paid a salary, and I might be ahead of the game. And so looking back now, that's probably not a bad idea, but I don't think the Coast Guard would have gone for that. But anyway, it was a great project. Uh, you can read more about it, but uh, we'll go to the next one there, Jeremy. Uh, now, this may be hard to see on your screen, but this is a uh, one of those large navigational buoys. This is a 12-meter Diameter buoy. The Weather Service always wanted weather data for the Great Lakes. What we do now and what we've done historically is put buoys out in, in the spring and then take them in in the fall. They wanted year round weather observations. So uh, we made it happen. We did it with this buoy. I was the engineer behind it. Um, and one more picture there, Jeremy. This was, we designed a mooring for it. It worked flawlessly. It was a intricate mooring where it would move throughout the winter and then re-moor itself. And uh, I spent some time up there working on lighthouses as well as buoys. And then uh, I wanna jump over now, uh, if we can. Uh, most of us remember the perfect storm. Uh, I talked about it previously. That storm, uh, I actually drove from Montauk the ferry, the Cross Sound ferry was not working. Uh, they had shut it down. I drove all the way around back to Rhode Island. I was in a helicopter the next morning at 7 a.m. Uh, off the coast of New England. And it wasn't a Coast Guard helicopter. It was a National uh, Guard helicopter because all the Coast Guard helicopters were still busy making rescues across the uh, Northeast. Uh, so I was in a what's called a Huey. It's a UH-1. Uh, they don't ride very well. They're Vietnam uh, era helicopters. Uh, so I'm bouncing around in this thing for about seven hours up and down the coast of New England. Uh, we had to refuel a couple of times, but um, what had happened is we had suffered terrible damage to all of our offshore structures. And the only solution we could think of was to come up with going to solar. Very fortunately, there was a company, uh, Vega, uh, out of New Zealand that had come up with a lantern, DC powered, so we could use solar. And we'll go through these pretty quickly, Jeremy, but here's the, uh, what we did. We, we came up with all these projects to convert these to solar. So this was the first one, Isla Shoals, the only offshore structure in New Hampshire, but we started here. Uh, that covered walkway between the keeper's house and the tower tells you a little something about the uh, conditions that, at, uh, you know, that's fine, Jerry. We'll jump over. You can see a close up of the, this solar array is probably 40 feet tall. I've got another picture here of a gentleman, a Coast Guardsman, on the back of it. We'll here, so you can really see the size. Believe it or not, this, this solar array did not survive. Um, probably early 2000, we had a storm that took it out. We had to rebuild it. But it just shows you uh, what it took to get these back up and running um, from the old days of the diesel engine generators. And we'll walk through these, Jeremy. If you just keep clicking here, I'll talk about this is Mount Desert Rock. And I want to, this is kind of my before and after. Uh, so this is before you see those white huts. That's what we had at all these offshore. They're probably 20 feet by 12 foot. 
uh, diesel engine generators, equipment, everything. Plus, as you can see, the house there, the old keeper's house was in pretty tough shape. The boathouse, pretty tough shape. So we'll go to the after picture. This is what it looks like after. So, and I'm a big fan of red roofs. Uh, I'm ecstatic that Montauk has gone back to a red roof on the keeper's uh, house. But here's my after. And then you can see the solar array over there to your left. But uh, totally restored the entire keeper's dwelling, the boathouse. Um, now, this is 27 miles out to sea in the Gulf of Maine. So not the easiest place to get to. Uh, keep going, Jeremy. We'll get through these last ones. Here's the solar array at Mount Desert Rock. And then keep going, Jeremy. We'll get to uh, this is my main, this is my preferred means of transportation. Um, and I'll tell you, I got to give a tip of the hat to the uh, pilots in the air station. They did do a great job. They supported us. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them. A lot of materials had to move by air, and they did a great job of doing that for us. And then keep going here, Jeremy. We'll get to the next Boone Island, 133 feet. Not much out on Boone Island. It's the tallest of all the New England layout. There's the solar array. And keep going, Jeremy. Uh, this is Matinicus. Uh, interesting. I, I just will uh, share one tidbit. Made famous by Abby Burgess who was the daughter, 16-year-old daughter of Keeper Burgess, who maintained the two lights for over a month while her father was off ashore. The Coast Guard named the ship after her. She ended up marrying a light keeper and continuing in. So you can see the solar array there. And Keep going, Jeremy. We'll get through these next few here. This is uh, Libby. Libby Island, we did a lot of work on Libby. Libby is 200 years old this year. Quite a, quite a structure. And we'll just kind of walk through these, Jeremy. Keep going. Uh, you can see we rebuilt the boat bay while we were there. This is all done by hand, folks. All these are civilian workers for the Coast Guard out of Boston and, and Portland, Maine. And we'll show you what it looks at high tide. you got quite the range of high tide there. I would go out and spend days out there with them working working on the island. And uh, it's it's an amazing place. This is what it looks like at high tide once we finish building the uh, the boat bay. And then keep going, Jeremy. We'll get through here. There's the solar array, a pretty small one compared to the others. And then we'll get through here. Execution Rocks down off of uh, New York City. We had a nor'easter there in 93 that destroyed our building, all of our generators. And so we converted that to solar as well. I share some tidbits in the... Um, uh, in the book about execution rocks, uh, you can believe a couple of different stories, how it's got its name. It always gave me uh, a little uneasy feeling being I spent a lot of time at, at uh, execution rocks with Harry Duvall and Harry and I both. It wasn't one of our favorite spots. Uh, not that we believed in ghosts or anything, but it just wasn't one of our favorite spots. <laughs> Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, moving on here, Jerry, we'll keep going. There's the final solar array, and that's what it looks like today with the uh, cleanup and all the repairs we made. And then uh, I think we've got uh, a couple more little things I talk about in the book are optics. Uh, this was Seguin light that we had a, uh, a piece of first order uh, lens missing. I found a piece at the Coast Guard Academy and we were able to put it back in. And then one other one I'll share with you was down in the Chesapeake Bay area, Craig Hill. This was a Charlie Baines project. I wanted to show you what it looked like originally to the left and then what it looks like today. But we had a clamshell Fresnel lens in there for a range light. And Charlie and I got a call from the pilots one night and they said, hey, what you know, what's going on with the range light? It looks foggy. It's not really clear and focused. So Charlie and I made a trip out there and we found that the center and go to the next picture there, uh, Jeremy, the center of that clamshell Fresnel lens, someone had broken in and had stolen it. So uh, we, we were like, you got to be kidding me. No wonder it's foggy. So we couldn't, we, we didn't have another spare Fresnel lens. We didn't have anything else to try to repair it. So Charlie and I came up with this idea of a uh, what was called a DCB uh, 10, 10 inch diameter 
bullseye lens. As you can see, that's my hands there at work. We drilled and tapped that uh, brass frame and we installed this uh, bullseye lens in there. The pilots loved it. We, we went out that night, we called the pilots. They said, hey, that's absolutely fantastic. The light couldn't be better. What'd you guys do? And so we told them, hey, we, we, we got it repaired. It ended up um, lasting for about 20, 20 some odd years and was eventually replaced. And then to wrap up here, I just wanna go to one last picture and I wanna talk about long-term lighthouse preservation. And I, I'll have one more picture of my, my hometown light here in a second, but um, this is a picture uh, that I took uh, from Hair and Neck, and this started it. Um, I have a whole section in the book on long-term pres preservation. Something I learned very early on in, in working on lighthouses in that, uh, that we need to preserve these structures. Uh, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, there's so much history. There's so much uh, uh, character to these structures and the people and the stories. I've shared a few this afternoon. There's countless others. But uh, Harry and I, uh, along with another gentleman by the name of Ted Dernago, uh, worked on a program called the Main Lights Program, where we transferred 33 properties directly to nonprofits. And then that was a precursor to the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, which the society had a big part in. And I actually hosted Congressman Mark Souter, who drafted the legislation for the NHLPA. And this started it all. And this is why this picture is so near and dear to me. This was in November, the week before Thanksgiving. Harry and I had gone out. We Again, it's probably started about four or five that morning. And this is on Heron Neck. It is snowing, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's freezing cold. And there's a 41-foot Coast Guard boat off the island. Harry and I had to roll, row in in what was known as a pea pod, a little lighthouse uh, boat that keepers kept. We rowed in, and we had to do some engineering documentation in order to transfer this property. Had we not done that, the entire main lights program would not have uh, gotten off uh, off to a good start anyway. And so Harry and I were committed that we were going to get this done regardless of what. And so we we did. Uh, it ended up being a uh, a long day. We drove I think back to Portland, Maine in a blizzard, but uh, we made it. So, and then one last picture, and we'll stop there. This is my hometown light of Newburyport, uh, otherwise known as Plum Island Light. And it's a classic story of how a small group uh, known as the Friends of Plum Island, I've had a long association with them for 30 years. Uh, it's all started with a small group of folks, um, a woman by the name of Barbara Kieser. Sadly, Barbara's no longer with us, but uh, Barbara was a descendant of uh, original uh, keeper, um, George uh, Kieser. And then we also, our current president, uh, Jen Bogart is the descendant of Keeper Woods, uh, who was a, this long-term lighthouse preservation through the NHLPA and through transfer to private organizations, um, convinced me that this is the way to go for long-term preservation. I'm honored to look at it. Honored to be part of this society and uh, be part of it. So we'll we'll stop there, Jeremy. I know we ran a little bit late, but hopefully we got some time for any Q and A. Sure. Okay. I just came out of screen sharing, and Dan, I just want to make the point that uh, you didn't take too long. Don't worry about that for a second, because that's <laughs> the nice nice thing about these events is that they're as long as they need to be, kind of like podcast episodes. So. Uh, you know, I find it absolutely fascinating. I could listen to it all night. I also want to mention uh, somebody had your mic unmuted a, a minute ago. Uh, just be sure to keep your mics muted unless we're calling on you to, to speak. So I appreciate that. Uh, but that was that was great, Dan. I knew it would be. And I want to remind everybody that if they want to read more detail on any of those stories, get... <laughs> Dan's book, Preserving yeah, America's the, Lighthouse. The proceeds, the proceeds go to the Lighthouse Society. So uh, 
I kind of felt bad saying uh, you've got to read about it, but uh, all the proceeds go to the Lighthouse Society, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. There's some uh, funny stories, as you can you can imagine. Yeah, well, and thank you for mentioning that, Dan. Uh, thank you for for that for uh, you know for uh, the proceeds going to the U.S. Lighthouse Society. So let's see here. Let me let me look at the the chat here. Um. I haven't had because I was sharing the screen. I wasn't able to look at the chat. Yeah, no, I think, uh, and I'll say hi to D. D, thank you for joining us. Uh, D is one of my old uh, workmates from uh, CEU Providence, and uh, D had a hand in the Montauk project because uh, we had just started with a brand new uh, CAD system and a brand new specification, and D probably spent countless hours writing up the specifications for my revetment at Montauk. So it wouldn't have happened without her. Thank you, Dee, and thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, somebody said in the chat, each person can control the display of other participants. Um, when I mentioned that during your presentation, Dan, I didn't mean the um, uh, the little windows of uh, like you and me on the right, but I meant an actually uh, like a, a rectangle listing all the people in the room. I was ha I had that on my screen, but I wasn't sure if everybody else was seeing it or not. But I tried to move it out of the way as much as I could. So I don't know if I'm being clear, but I wasn't sure. So anyway, I apologize if it was in the way at all. Yeah, I know. I see a couple of uh, – there is a great book. Thank you for mentioning uh, the great book about Abby Burgess. There's a whole lot of stories there to be told that um, – and then I see uh, keep the lights there. burning, Abby. Uh, the children's book classic. Yeah. Um, Tony Rosati says hi, Jeremy. The International Chimney Corporation gave a presentation at the National Lighthouse Conference in Key West, Florida. I was there in 1999. <laughs> it was cut short by a hurricane, but I was there for what we. Uh, uh, yeah, um, actually, um, I think Joe did a presentation there. I also saw a presentation on that era by Rick Lore as well of uh, International Chimney. So Joe is here with us today. And uh, Joe, if you are so inclined, we'd love to hear from you if uh, if he's still in the, the room here. Um, so I just want to make sure Joe knows that, that uh, if you'd like to say anything or ask anything, we would love to hear from you, Joe. Um, what is the best resource to find history on the Coast Guard slash life-saving station history in the Great Lakes? I'm not sure I know the answer to that question off the yeah, top of I'm my head. I'm not sure I do. There's a Maritime Museum in Marquette um, right. that I would recommend. They have great, uh, and there's a couple other uh, maritime organizations in the Great Lakes, but uh, Marquette comes to mind. Uh, because they have a great uh, source of history. So I would suggest starting there. Yeah, I agree. I, I was out there last year and Fred Stonehouse, uh, who's associated with the Marquette Maritime Museum there, has written quite a few books about the, the Coast Guard, lighthouse, and life-saving uh, history of that area, shipwrecks and so forth. So I recommend Fred's, Fred Stonehouse's books. What battery type and capacity is typical for these solar power installations? Those are usually large, they're wet cells. Um, you can use dry cell, but what would the Coast Guard was using on these big, big, big solar arrays? Uh, they're massive batteries. They are probably two feet tall and a foot square. They weigh a ton, um, but uh, they're wet cell batteries, but they, they last for a long time and they've held up very, very well. Mm-hmm. Um, our friend Shalana says, great presentation as always. She's wondering if the book will eventually be available as an ebook. Uh, the answer to that, I'd say, is a definite maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I will discuss that, Dan, but we've talked a bit about it, and I would like to make it eventually available as, a, as an ebook as well as the, the paperback. But anybody who has a Lighthouse book collection needs to have the book. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 soft cover of the uh, book in their uh, library. Uh, thank you, Dan. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a way to buy Dan's book directly, not Amazon? The answer to that question is there, there will be, um, it's not on the uh, U.S. It's only been available for a, a week or two now, and it's not on the U S lighthouse society online gift shop yet, but we're going to make that happen very soon. I would say hopefully in the coming week, 
Uh, so it will be available directly from the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Um, Dan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I know there's... Yeah, no, I think the Lighthouse Society is a good... There's some other uh, organizations that uh, uh, will be providing cop copies to that you can, if you're... I can certainly say Montauk, uh, if you're in that area, we'll, we'll have it available and uh, probably some places up here in New England. I know um, uh, Plum Island, our, our small friends uh, will be selling copies if anyone is in the local area. Uh, certainly, by all means, that, uh, that will help the local uh, groups as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the somebody asks what the, uh, the the images behind me that I'm using is the background image that is Block Island Southeast Lighthouse, Southeast. the yeah. Mohegan Bluffs on Block Island. That is after the move that Dan talked about. So that picture is from the late 90s. So uh, are there any other? Oh, here's more things coming up in the chat. Cape Lookout's first order for Nell Lens. Right, Dan. Uh, well, actually, you talked about the the move of the yep. lens to Block yep. Island Southeast. Yeah, yeah. Cheryl, that's Cheryl Roberts who commented on that. Our friend Cheryl yeah. is here. Yeah, as well. no. And um, I I mentioned in the book um, we did receive a letter from the state of North Carolina, uh, letting us know that uh, gee, if we ever take that lens out of Block Island, they would like it back in North Carolina. Um, and I think that uh, was something the Coast Guard said, well, we'll think about it. But uh, as I think we all know, lenses were uh, put in lighthouses. They were taken out of line. They were moved all around the country. And so you you just never know. This was an operational need that the Coast Guard had at the time. And uh, we put it to good use. And I think it's worked out extremely well. But thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Kathy Kennedy says, thanks from a fellow UR, URI alumni. Well, um, yes. I wanted to mention that um, you mentioned Frying Pan Shoal, the old Texas tower, which still exists and is privately owned, as you mentioned. I have the website up in front of me, fptower.org, if anybody's interested. They're, they're still restoring it. And they're calling it an ecotourism adventure. You can volunteer and go out there and help them restore it. So if you want to get on an actual... Yeah, I Texas Tower. I, thanks for mentioning that, Jeremy. I, I looked on their website. I was almost tempted if I was down there to go out there just to see it again. But um, it, it in the fine print, it tells you you must be in good health and it's uh, not the easiest place to get to. So they, they're a little bit of uh, fine print there you, you have to read, but uh, yeah, it is a great spot. Uh, one of the other towers, I think, sold for $20,000, which had to be a pretty good bargain uh, for an offshore tower, but uh, interesting places to say the least. Yeah. Um, Tony uh, asks, will the U.S. Lighthouse Society let us know when Dan's book will be available directly through their website? Yes, it'll definitely go out in a, in a uh, email blast to everybody when that happens. And like I said, we're going to, uh, I'm hoping that's going to happen this coming week. I think there's a really good chance that'll happen. Does the book have Great Lakes Lighthouses? Um, you want to take that question, Dan? Yeah, I, I didn't include any in there, although I worked on a bunch um, and I probably should have. I, I think I uh, spent some time working on a number of uh, lighthouses in the Great Lakes, uh, Standard Rock, uh, one of those. And I had some interesting stories to tell about those. But uh, in the interest of time and content, I ended up uh, foregoing that. But uh, maybe that's a story for another day. Mm hmm um to do to do thank you dan we learned so much from you grateful for all you have done and continue to do that's a i, I second nice, that man. thank you <laughs> yeah oh that's from jen bogard yeah, and thank i you, think dan. she's saying that that just not just because she's a friend but because <laughs> <laughs> i totally agree uh so i don't know if there's any further questions or if anybody, uh, we have a lot of friends here in the audience, if anybody wants to verbally say something, uh, if you want to do that uh, on your Zoom controls uh, down under reactions, it's down the bottom towards the right, click on react on the little arrow next to reactions. And I, see, I see Sally dressed for the occasion. Sally, thank you for dressing for the occasion. <laughs> yes. And so I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, things in the news recently about Sally 
in the New Yorker um, magazine. And there's, I know there's something coming up in the Christian Science Monitor, among other places. Uh, Sally is retiring. Uh, Dan talked about the beginnings of her time as a keeper at Boston Light. And uh, it's a bittersweet time, I'm sure, <laughs> for Sally and her husband, Jay, here. Uh, so I don't know if you want to say anything. You don't have to say anything now, Sally, but you're more than welcome to if you'd like to. Um, up to you if you want to. Okay, that <laughs> want to say hi. Yeah. Just let us know if you want to say anything. Again, if anybody wants to speak uh, verbally, click on the little arrow next to reactions. Do uh, raise hand and we'll call on you. Uh, I don't see anybody doing that. Uh, more people are thanking you, Dan. Thanks for your amazing work. We're fortunate that you saved as many lighthouses, etc. Thanks from a fellow CGA grad, 66. Your career is admirable. Wow. Indeed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I, at this point, we should probably think about winding things down here. I'll mention again, Dan mentioned it a couple of times, that we do have an upcoming uh, event, another Zoom event on December 5th at 7 p.m., all about Montauk, the recent restoration, especially the the reinstallation of that beautiful uh, Fresnel lens in the Lantern Room, which is a fantastic project. As Dan mentioned, we actually did a tour, a U.S. Lighthouse Society tour there in May, this past May, that I was I led, and uh, I believe there were some people in the room who were part of that tour. And seeing the the lens in the museum was exciting, but seeing it back in the Lantern is is just absolutely fantastic. Um, so. Uh, Dan, anything you'd like to add before we... Uh... Uh, just a final thank you, Jeremy, for getting through. And uh, I uh, appreciate everybody hanging in on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, I know there was a lot there. I uh, apologize for going a little fast towards the end. But uh, as Jeremy said, uh, you know, we could, we could spend hours talking about this. But I realize uh, we have to be uh, mindful and respectful of people's time. So hopefully you enjoyed it. And... If you um, want to read a little bit more, uh, you can uh, pick up a copy of the book and, and I assure you they'll, you'll get some more of the uh, details and some more of the stories that went behind the story I share with you tonight. Yeah, absolutely. The stories behind the stories. Uh, and I'll mention also, if people want more detail, we did uh, I did a podcast interview with you, Dan. It was split up into two episodes. Yes. Yep. So people can search for that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you can find the podcast Lighthearted through any podcast app or get on uh, the U.S. Lighthouse Society website. And you'll find it easily enough on the, right on the front page. But um, past episodes are available. If you can't find them, you can you can find me and I'll tell you how to find them. Uh, so new episodes are posted every Sunday. I was just at the outer, on the Outer Banks a outer few weeks Banks. ago. Yeah. And I'm posting my interview Fantastic. done at Cape Hatteras uh, tomorrow. Uh, so with that said, I'm, I think I've gotten all the important business in here. I thank you all again for being here today as always. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much for a great presentation. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, so we will see you again. Hopefully we'll see a lot of you on December 5th. In the meantime, happy Thanksgiving. And happy keep a good Thanksgiving, light. everybody. We'll see you hopefully all on the 5th.